All right. Hi, everyone. We've just had a great conversation with Dr. Marissa G. Franco. She's a psychologist, professor at the University of Maryland, and author of the recently published New York Times bestselling book, Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. She writes about friendship for psychology today, and she's been a featured connection expert for major publications, including the New York Times, The Telegraph, and Vice. On our website, you can take a quiz to assess your strengths and weaknesses as a friend. Nick and I have both taken this quiz. We highly recommend it. Our conversation today focused on the role of platonic relationships in flourishing and why they're so important for our well-being and how we can apply the extensive research Marissa's done in her latest book, Platonic, to cultivate healthy, strong platonic relationships in our lives and how that can ultimately support our flourishing and the flourishing of those with whom we have platonic relationships. It was a great conversation. Nick, what did you most enjoy about this? You just said it. I think it was the how-to piece, right? Coming into this conversation, you and I were pretty familiar with a lot of the research on the why. Like, why should we care about relationships? Basically, because it improves everything in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Significantly correlated with life satisfaction. And Marissa added to that, but she also really layered in a lot of insights and nuances around the how Mm -hmm. um, that I think will be really practical for our listeners. So she was a real delight, um, amazing expert, lots of practical advice, um, and we had a lot of fun. So here it is. We hope you enjoy our conversation with Dr. Marissa G. Franco. Hi, Marissa. How are you doing? Good. Good. Pleasure to meet you. Marissa, welcome today. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Where are you calling in from today? It looks like you're in a classroom. Yeah, I'm a professor at University of Maryland, so this is one of our offices. Right, you've been been teaching today? I teach a class on loneliness. It's awesome. Okay, well, that's... Well, that must be an all yeah, that must be an awesome class, and that's going to connect quite nicely with what we're going to discuss today. So, Nick and I loved your book, Platonic. Mm-hmm. It's take you know taken away so much from it, and we're looking forward to deep diving into it with you today. And there's clear connections throughout it with flourishing. And I noticed you even used the word flourishing multiple times: flourish and thrive. You talk about you know what it means for our friendships to thrive and our uh, platonic friendships in particular to thrive. And we'll come on to talk about what a platonic friendship is in a moment. But first of all. What motivated you to write this book? Yeah. So when I was in my young 20s, I was going through these breakups and taking them really hard. So I decided to start this wellness group with my friends where we met up to practice wellness together. We meditated, cooked, did yoga. Strong recommend if you're considering (laughs) because it was really healing for me. And it wasn't the wellness as much as it was being in community with people every week who I loved, who loved me. And the whole experience made me question some of the beliefs I had been taught about love up to that point, which was, you know, romantic love is the only love that makes you lovable. It's the only love that counts. If you don't have that form of love, you have no love, right? So I looked at my friends and I'm like, well, why doesn't this love count? It really feels like it counts, right? Like, why do we treat platonic love as auxiliary, as unnecessary, as disposable? And um, I felt like, you know, the personal is political, that my experience was reflecting broader cultural trends, you know, and, and it's it shocks me in a society that's so lonely that we devalue any form of connection. To me, friendship is like we have gold under our feet, but we see it as concrete. So I wanted to write platonic because I wanted to begin mm. to equalize this love hierarchy that we all implicitly have and that I think is harmful for those of us within or outside of romantic relationships. Right. So there's a perfect bridge and segue there. Like, can can we nerd out for a second on the concepts and terms and just be real clear about definitions? So the book, the title is platonic, right? Mm -hmm. You're using words like love. How are those similar? How are those different? What's that hierarchy of terminology kind of look like in your world? Good question. Um, So love is, I guess, an umbrella term and it can be platonic, which comes from based on, you know, Plato, which is like a love so deep it transcends the physical, which is its original definition. Interestingly, I don't think we perceive it that way in the same way now. Um, But love can also be romantic, which means passionate. I'm excited about someone. They thrill me. They excite me. I yearn for them, right? And, And interestingly enough, as I wrote Platonic, I realized asexual scholars kind of taught me, like Angela Chen, that romance 
has always been a part of friendship, like romantic friendship mm. exists. It has always existed, right? We're enthralled by our friends, especially when you hear like women talk about their best friends. They'll be like, she's my soulmate. I want to spend all my time with her. I can't wait to see her. I love her so much, right? These things that sound very romantic, but what friendship isn't is it's not inher- it's inherently non-sexual, right? So that's another form of love, sexual love. We are technically not having friends, having sex with our friends by definition. Um, so those are the different forms of love that we can experience. So platonic love here is the only difference between platonic love between friends and between partners um, that there isn't the sexual connection. But you can literally be in love with a friend. In yes. Sense. Yeah. You you can. I mean, because you can have romantic love and friendship, right? And so you you know people do report being feeling like is it a thing? I get this question on my Instagram. Is it a thing to be in love with your friends, right? And I think what they're meaning is I'm experiencing this passion and this thrill from my friends, and I've told been told that that's only something that I would feel for a, a potential spouse, right? And mm. I think it can confuse people because they're like, am I want to have sex with them because I, I feel these romantic feelings, but no, those two things are distinct. You can want to be, you can feel passionate about someone and idealize them and be thrilled by them. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you want to have sex with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I love the quote, by the way, from a moment ago, you said, we have gold under our feet, but we see it as concrete. Thank is, you. That, is that your view on how people nowadays, at least in Western culture, are seeing the value of friendship? I, yeah, I do think we undervalue it. I mean, I think with the pandemic, there's been a little more movement in that people are like, yeah, two two years at home with my spouse has told me that I probably need more connection than this. Um, but, I, but, you know, I, I see it as we devalue friendship and it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because I don't see friendship as important or as worthy of being prioritized. Mm-hmm. I don't prioritize it. I'm not vulnerable. I don't share as much affection. Um, I don't support this person as deeply than I would a spouse, right? And then if you look at my behaviors, obviously that's what cause, is causing my friends to be as less deep than my relationship with my spouse. But I'm assuming that it's just because friendship has something inferior in its DNA, that friendship is inferior inherently, right? But it's not inferior. And if we treat our friends with the same degree of attention and care as one would treat a spouse, it can just get every bit as deep and meaningful as a spouse or relationship can. Like, I think in platonic, I'm really interested in blurring these lines we have for intimacy, right? Mm -hmm. Because we tend to compartmentalize intimacy so much where it's like, oh, only with a spouse can I like take someone on a date or can I be very vulnerable with them or can I fly across the country to see them or even people have you know been talking about friends as life partners right or raising kids with friends right but what I see in platonic is like intimacy is intimacy Mm -hmm. the things that you do to develop intimacy with your spouse develop intimacy with your friends right like sharing affection, being intentional about showing them how special they are, being vulnerable with them, uh, working through conflict instead of ghosting, right? Like we can transfer these set of skills from one relationship to another. And we don't have to assume that it's a completely, friendship is a completely different species from other forms of intimacy. Cool. So I'm super tempted. I know John is too. Like we would love to start getting into the how-to questions. You started teasing it there a little bit. And I'm and so I'm hearing like, what's the value in these different types of relationships? Okay, there's a Venn diagram, but these are still distinct, right? What's the value? How does that potentially lead to a mindset that then generates these self-fulfilling prophecies? And ideally, you'd probably like your readers to have a mindset that generates a really positive, social, healthy, self-fulfilling prophecy. But before we get into how to, can we just like double click on the value piece? And if you talk a little bit, maybe even just at the 30,000 foot level, you know, John and I know we're familiar with a lot of the research, but if you could lay it on people, why is this so important? Like what, what did all the studies show in terms of like the impact on flourishing and meaning and happiness and mental, all the things, right? Yeah. Uh, Ed Diener, he has this study on very happy people, what defines them and, uh, he finds that it's not things we would think of, like maybe like religious beliefs or exercise or even how many good things happen to you. That's not, none of those are the most pronounced differences between very happy and unhappy people. The number one difference between those two groups of people is how socially connected they are. Um, meta-analyses basically find that, of course, diet and exercise affects our health and longevity, but 
social connection affects it more. It affects yeah. how long we live more than our diet, more than um, more than how much we're exercising. And yet we we spend so much more time thinking about those other things. And the other thing that I, I just want to emphasize, right, because clearly connection is a neighbor to our physical and mental health, right? It's very difficult to have good physical and mental health when you're isolated. But it's not just that, because there's actually, you know, John Cacioppo's work, he finds three different dimensions of loneliness. And one is intimate loneliness, which is I crave a very close companion, like a spouse or a best friend. But there's also relational loneliness, which is I crave someone as close to me as a friend. And then collective loneliness, which is I crave a group that has a common goal. So what his research suggests is that a spouse can really only fulfill one of those things. And we need an entire community to feel whole. This has been true throughout our history, right? Only very recently have we forgotten this truth. And by forgetting it, we are harming ourselves. We're damaging ourselves. Like we still very much need an entire community to feel whole. Perfect. Thank, yeah, what thank it, you for that. Sorry, go on. Go yeah, on. That's, pretty, that's great. Yeah. T- tell our listeners, when you say loneliness, how are you conceptualizing that, right? Like we've heard kind of different definitions, but it seems it mostly centers around may- maybe one core, but I'm curious to see yeah. how do you think of loneliness? It's the subjective feeling that you don't have the social connection that you want. Okay. So it's, it's different from isolation, which is just you're not around people a lot. Mm-hmm. I also think of inauthenticity as a form of loneliness, right? That's mm. the kind of loneliness you can feel around other people when you don't actually feel connected to those people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Perfect. you have a whole chapter on authenticity, don't you? I do. <laughs> um, we should probably just briefly, yeah, so how, how are you defining an authenticity here? Is it not representing what you perceive as your true self around others and that's why you feel lonely because you're not presenting how you actually feel about yourself within yeah. the community? Yeah, I do. I mean, I I struggled with the the chapter on authenticity because everybody defines it as like this true self. But um, then I'm like, well, what is the true self, right? And so as I, I went through all the different research, I found that people kept reporting feeling most authentic when they felt most safe, when they were around people mm. that really loved them and valued mm. them. And so I kind of took it one step further and defined authenticity as a state of presence that we're in when we feel safe. And we're not hijacked by defense mechanisms. So Mm -hmm. what is a defense mechanism? It's a way of obscuring or pushing away a scary feeling that we have and replacing it with a behavior that then harms our relationships, right? So so the example I, I talk about in the book is like, my friend's kid got into Brown. I didn't, my kid didn't get into Brown. And I feel very jealous. But instead of admitting that vulnerable feeling, which would be more authentic, I say, you know, Brown isn't the best Ivy League anyway. Like Harvard's kind of better um, than Brown, right? I say something as a defense mechanism to defend against those jealous feelings, those feelings of inferiority. I instead engage in this defense mechanism, which then harms my relationship. So um, authenticity is about not being hijacked by those defense mechanisms. And we really only know who we are when we can feel safe. It comes to mind some of the research, I think I, I understand it this way anyway, is suggesting that generally like good friendships, at least, however you define that, there might be distinctions, are often guided by like a preponderance of pleasantness and like pretty limited unpleasantness. Do do you agree with that sort of conceptualization for the Mm -hmm. most part? I do. I do. Um, I think that's what we tend to see. And actually the ambivalent friendships, which are more of a balance of positive and negative, actually hurt our well-being and our blood pressure more than our enemies because <laughs> the unpredictability piece of it. So it tends to be true. And, and, you know, I think it, it makes sense because like, you know, we're sort of biologically hardwired to kind of remember these negative experiences and focus on them more than the positive. So you need so many more positive to kind of outweigh the negative. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. So loneliness, as I understand, just to go back to actually our first question was one of the things that motivated you to write this book right and I mean clearly you have a deep interest in this you're teaching a course on it right now <laughs> yeah, so I mean yeah. um as I just want to tease out uh, give give listeners a little more info on the book as well because the book is about adults right yep. born the difficulties in forming a friendship in adulthood because as, as you point out it's often easier as a child or adolescent to form friendships so could you say a little bit about what what exactly provoked you to write this book about loneliness? What what exactly the, the, the particular problem is you're, you're most concerned with? Yeah, 
I am concerned about loneliness. I think it's a global crisis. I mean, there was a recent analysis that found that, you know, since early 2000, or I think it was maybe around 2010, that uh, 35 out of 37 countries, kids had increased in their level of loneliness at school. So it's literally been on the rise since the 1950s. It's devastating for our mental health. It's devastating for our physical health. And not only that, like when we're lonely, it triggers a series of behaviors that are harmful for social connection, right? Like people that are lonely, I like to say it's not just a mood, it's a way of seeing the world because lonely people are vigilant that they're being rejected. They tend to think they're being rejected when they're not. And that affects their behaviors and that if you think everyone's rejecting you, you're not gonna show up in the world very kindly. So lonely people are more likely to reference themselves more in conversation, more hostile towards other people. Lonely people, when they interact with someone, they report liking that person less than people that aren't lonely, have less compassion towards humanity. People that are high in something called social cynicism, which means that their need for connection is kind of frustrated. They're more likely to be unethical, um, less likely Mm -hmm. to trust social institutions, right? So loneliness has very far-reaching consequences. And I, I... it's hard for me to picture a society that is healthy and it's functioning with if everybody is lonely. Like I think, and I think, you know, there's also a lot of research on how like social connection is how we create social change. You know, one study finding that when people connect with someone from a different group, they're more likely to support policies for that group. And not only that, their friends are more likely to support policies for that group because they became friends with that person. So also, if we want to keep progressing as a society, like we need social connection, which is why I think when we're lonely, we're we're so, it's, it's very devastating for us as individuals and for us as a society. But I'll say that platonic and being about how we make and keep friends, from my view, especially teaching this class on loneliness and understanding how society has made it so that we're so lonely. I'm teaching people to swim upstream against the current to try to still find connection. What I would prefer is that the current wasn't going in this direction, right? Um, but I say that because I think it's important that, you know, when I read the research on loneliness, for example, people that blame themselves for being lonely are more likely to continue to be lonely. So mm-hmm. I think it is really important to recognize that as much as I'm sharing tips on connection, and I think it's possible to still find connection, that there is a very much societal cultural factor at play that is pulling us to disconnect. So it sounds like one of the research studies that really interested you is the one, some of the ones perhaps you just mentioned there about loneliness and about Mm -hmm. the ways in which it it can make someone be even more lonely because of the kind of behaviours they exhibit and so on. And so something that Nick and I would really like to ask you is, were there any studies you came across in your research that really surprised you about friendship and about relationships flourishing, the relationship between them and so on? There was, I mean, every chapter, there's something that surprised <laughs> yeah. me. This is a curation of things that surprised Marissa. And thus, is that that's the book. <laughs> that's the thesis for the book in some ways. But I will say one of the biggest ones where I realized, and every chapter, I'm like, I've been screwing up. Like, I, it's important for me to acknowledge that I did not come writing this book being like, I'm amazing at friendship. Let me tell you about all the things that I have intuited about connection, right? I came at this book being like, I'm fascinated by this topic and I'm an academic, so I can get into the science here and help us all do a little better, including myself. So um, when it came to my chapter on, on handling conflict with friends, my thought was that being a good friend means I ignore conflict and try to get over it on my own. So I don't stress anyone out, right? Mm. And um, I really tried to do that. And my one of my best friends, I wasn't reaching out to her as much. And I was like, huh, if I'm withdrawing, maybe this isn't the best way for me to handle this conflict. So I come across this study and it's like having open empathic conflict is actually linked to deeper intimacy and that people that really value friendship and actually tend to bring up conflict um, when there's issues in the friendship and that people that bring up conflict are more liked (laughs) and less lonely. Um, So all this research is telling me, okay, maybe it's not the best approach to ignore conflict and, um, but it depends on how you do it. So my problem with conflict, right, is that 
my concept of conflict was like attack, antagonism, right? Like blame. And so that's the thing where I was like, I don't want to engage in that. I think that's going to harm our friendships because that does harm your friendship when that's what conflict looks like. But me realizing that that there's a third option, there's conflict that feels more like reconciliation and love and collaboration, right? And that's what I realized while writing this book, which, you know, should seem obvious now in retrospect, but wasn't for me at the time, especially in friendship, because I was, again, engaging in this problem that I that I identify that we cordon off what we learn from romantic partners from our friendship. So I could have learned from my romantic partners that, hey, we need to talk through issues and these are some set of skills to do them, but I didn't transfer those skills to my friendship. So um, I ended up bringing up the issue that I had with my best friend and it was really beautiful and we felt so much closer after. And I realized in some ways what psychoanalyst Virginia Goldner had said that you can either have comfortable intimacy in your relationships where there's intimacy because you pretend nothing's wrong, but you can also have dynamic safety, which is deeper. And that's, we rupture and we repair and we rupture and we repair. And we trust that we can have disagreements and talk about them openly and come back together. So I feel like I accessed a whole new level of intimacy in some of my closest friendships. It seems like kind of pulling back, and this will bridge us into the conversation about systemic change. It seems like so much of what you're describing, not just the research, but some of this this anecdote, if you will, brings up this kind of proverbial chicken and egg scenario. Like you you get out what you put in sort of deal. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering, like now I'm kind of thinking developmentally. It, do you know the answer? That, like, is it a chicken or an egg that starts it? Like, is it love poured into at a young age? Is it friendships and early adolescence? Like, are there things yeah. that we can look at over the trajectory of a life and kind of say, well, you get out what you put in, but like, if you don't get this stuff at this age or these formidable years, you're really, you know, you're really uh, pushing the ball uphill, so to speak. Well, I think what you're referencing is attachment theory, right? Like. Yeah. These people that are really securely attached, I call them super friends. They initiate more. Their relationships are more sustainable. They're better at conflict. Their relationships are less likely to end. Really, really good at friendship. What's their secret? Their secret is they had very good, healthy relationships at a young age, and they've internalized that. And they bring a set of assumptions into their new relationships that really help them maintain friendship, which is people like me. I can trust people. I can be vulnerable with them, right? Like we can work through issues together and get closer afterwards, right? Really healthy set of assumptions. But I also want to mention, because when I talk about attachment theory, sometimes people are like, well, good for those people with healthy parents, (laughs) right? (laughs) Too bad for me, I guess. And that's really not what I'm trying to say. I think we can all change our attachment style. Platonic is literally about how to change our attachment style and become more securely attached. Um, and you know, some research finds our attachment style is more likely to change than it is to stay the same. So there's totally hope. All of us can become more secure over time, literally teaching my students how to do this in my loneliness class. And so even Mm. if we haven't had, you know, those healthy relationships growing up, there's something called earned secure, which means you had to do a little extra work, but you earned that, that secure attachment and those secure relationships that come out of that with others. Perfect. Okay. So, sorry, Nick, do you want to say something? No, I was, well, see, now I'm tempted because I still want to, obviously want to get into that conversation about like systemic change, but you just gave us the perfect bridge to talk a little bit more specifically about attachment styles. Would you go into some of those different styles, you know, maybe in some ways that just the average listener would be able to, excuse the pun, but attach to and kind of (laughs) understand some of their, their behaviors? Yeah. So my larger framework for this is like, as I'm reading all this research, I'm like, wow, our personalities are a reflection of our experiences of connection or lack thereof, right? In some ways, our personalities are like coping mechanisms for the connection or lack thereof that we've experienced. So whether I'm friendly, I'm warm, I'm cynical, I'm distrusting, I'm aggressive, right? All of these things are predicated on our past experiences of connection. So that's kind of what attachment theory is. Like our previous experiences of connection have shaped our personalities. And then these personalities that we form shape our continued experiences of connection. So the secure people, right? I've talked about them. They've had healthy relationships. How do you see them show up as friends? They're more likely to initiate, less likely to end friendships, more likely to address conflict more likely to perspective take, they engage in something called mutuality, which means they're thinking about your needs 
and their needs at the same time and trying to figure out something that works for both of you. They'll like de-escalate during conflict. They'll engage in this perspective taking. Um, They just, and research interestingly finds that people can have the same conversation and the secure person will feel more intimate in that conversation than the people that are insecurely attached. Mm. Um, They tend to think that others are trustworthy, that others will like them. They're comfortable with vulnerability, but different from anxiously attached people who I'll talk about they tend to modulate their vulnerability. So if they're vulnerable, you're not vulnerable back, they won't continue to be vulnerable, right? Okay. And, you know, there's this this other thing that they tend to also seek relationships with people that treat them very well and that reflect their sort of secure sense of themselves. Um, then you have anxiously attached people and they've learned that people will abandon them. And they bring that to every relationship. They tend to see rejection when it's not there. Literally in their brains, their amygdala is lighting up more to negative social experiences than the other attachment styles. They ruminate on their relationships. The relationships feel consuming. They tend to use other people. They can be a little controlling because they tend to like self-regulate through other people. Like they need you to reassure them in order for them to feel regulated. They have trouble regulating their emotions on their own. They tend to form very quick, volatile friendships because, again, that's proof. You like me. You won't abandon me. Let's move super quick, right? But then they're volatile because the anxiously attached person is seeing rejection when it's not there. The anxiously attached person is being passive aggressive and not addressing conflict directly. The anxiously attached person is being so self-sacrificing, like being so generous towards other people to the point where they get resentful (laughs) towards the other person for all of their generosity. So there's, I call them sort of high effort, low reward in Mm. in their friendships. They're trying very hard, but they're not necessarily getting the same rewards as the secure person. Mm. Um, And then we have the avoidantly attached and they've learned in their childhood, if we get too close, you are going to harm me. So I have to keep people at a distance These avoidantly attached people, they don't initiate, they ghost. They're not really reaching out to maintain the friendship. If you're long distance from them, they're not really talking to you anymore. They're definitely not vulnerable. And not only that, if you're vulnerable, they're getting uncomfortable. Whereas the other attachment styles feel closer to you when you're vulnerable. The avoidantly attached person is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They tend to have like no needs in relationships and they expect other people to not really have needs in relationships. So they feel very easily burdened. They tend to enjoy relationships less. They tend to see relationships more for their liabilities and see a lot less of the rewards that are inherent to relationships. So they kind of get off as either they're kind of the lone wolf or they tend to have many shallow relationships and they feel like nobody really knows me and other people feel like I don't really know you. And so I I sort of describe them as um, low effort, low reward. Mm. It's worth mentioning that you you have surveys in your book that readers can complete to see which attachment style they, they fall into as well. And you have a, a friendship survey on your website, right? Yeah. I took yeah. it. I took it. You took it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm looking right at it. It's great. Okay. So is this did you design this yourself, person? I did, yeah, based on my read of the research. And I will say, since we're an academic audience, there was no factor analysis and confirmatory <laughs> right factor <enough>. analysis. <laughs> but these were different constructs of what makes someone a good friend according to the research that I assessed for and then gave people some suggestions to improve. I tend to see that um people score the lowest on um initiative taking initiative mm. when it comes to connecting with people and vulnerability so actually sharing vulnerable stuff with their friends and do you think that's in some on some level kind of moderated by age because i'm thinking i'm familiar generally we you see a, a use shape curve when it comes to sort of importance of happiness throughout a lifespan right so are mm. we talking like primarily populations that I don't know what the age range would be, but they, they have kids, young families, careers, those sorts of things. Or yeah. is this a little bit more generalizable than that? That's a great question. I don't know if I've seen an analysis of whether age moderates it. So it would be speculation, but I assume, okay. right? You're right. Probably in your 30s, it's uh, a little harder to initiate when you have all these other things on your plate. Sure. All right. So let's get on then to this systemic question that we've been teasing <laughs> this is about now for, for some time. So this was perhaps the, the most impactful claim in your book, that friendship might be, quote, necessary to trigger systemic change, end quote. So 
please, Marissa, tell us your argument for this. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to share a story in response to this. So I, you know, was a professor at a different institution trying to create a lot of social change, but I was also quite isolated. I was not connecting with my colleagues. There were systemic reasons for that. You know, I was the only, literally one of the only Black professors. And um, I also felt like I didn't understand why I needed to connect with people because I'm here to do work and I have this tenure clock over my shoulder. So that's going to take time away from me working, right? Yeah. But I would start to find that whenever I tried to advocate for something, I thought I had great ideas, but people were not supporting me, right? And even when it comes to like my work productivity, I'm working so hard, but I, I figure that I'm actually working harder, not smarter. Because other people would be like, you want to be on this grant with me? You want to be on this article with me? To people they had built relationships with. So I found, and again, I, I cite this, this study that, that looks at this, that when it comes to creating social change, one of the biggest predictors of people, of whether people will will kind of join you in creating this social change is whether they feel like they're friends with you, right? Mm. And we we tend to include friends in our sense of ourselves, which means that what happens to our friends almost feels like it's happening to us. Like it's kind of very natural for, for us to have empathy towards our friends, which means that friendship connection could be a great vehicle for us to begin to understand each other more deeply and support policies that support, you know, groups that have been historically disadvantaged, right? That people that have friends across racial lines are more likely to, to support policies for disadvantaged groups. So I think it is really key for um, for connection to happen if we want to socially progress. Now, what we see in the research is that people are a lot more likely to befriend people who are a similar race than them and a lot less likely to befriend people who are a different race than them. And when they do form those cross-racial friendships, they also tend to be more fragile. So I do think it's a, mm. it's um, needed, necessary, necessary, but not sufficient for social change. Do I think mm. we're doing it? <laughs> no. Do you know any of the causal mechanisms underneath those, those studies you just mentioned? That's fascinating. Which which study? Just the likelihood of, you know, who you might befriend or like why some of those friendships tend to be more fragile. Yeah. So um, what's his name? I think his name might be Jeffrey Cohen at Stanford. He has some research finding that like if you're sort of the only one of a disadvantaged group, you experience belonging uncertainty, which mm -hmm. means that basically when you are ex experience acceptance, your belonging kind of shoots up. But when you experience rejection, your belonging is a lot more fragile and can kind of go down a lot more greatly. So okay. an experience of like rejection can hit you so much more when it's, you know, a group from groups that you're not a part of, or you feel kind of ostracized from compared to if you're already part of that group. And I think, mm -hmm. I really think, and I think Jeffrey has some research on this, but I can't cite this on the top of my head that, because I talk about this with my students, like why is there so much bonding capital and not as much bridging social capital, right? Why do we tend to befriend people with a similar group? And I think it has to do with the fact that, you know, one of the things I talk about in the group is that in the, in platonic is that when you assume you'll be rejected, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like right. people that are rejection sensitive, they tend to assume they'll be rejected and they come off as cold and withdrawn in response to something ambiguous, which is like, my friend was tired, so they're not as talkative. And now I think they're rejecting me. So now I'm cold and now I'm withdrawn and then I reject them and then they reject me back. And I think this rejection sensitivity is happening across groups where I might think you're from a different race, so you're going to reject me. Now I'm actually coming off as cold and withdrawn. And we see that, right. we do see this in terms of like some research on black-white interactions that white people go into these interactions with this anxiety that I'm going to be perceived as prejudice. Right. And that racial anxiety mm. actually makes them avoid people of color or, or mm. black people mm. and <laughs> makes them kind of come off as prejudice. Whereas, you know, black people come into these interactions with fear of experiencing this prejudice, which then makes them avoid white people. Right. And and so that is sort of like, I think, the concepts that we bring into cross racial interaction, which make it so hard to connect with people that are different from us. It seems like you are teasing out this theme that comes up in literally 80% of the conversations we have, which is like the utility of some unpleasantness and discomfort, mm. right? In I order for good things to happen. is Am I understanding that correctly? You are, absolutely. You know, I talk about that 
I just was sharing this with my students. I was telling them about, you know, the mere exposure effect, which you all have probably heard of, which is, you know, this idea that by merely exposing to people, be, merely being exposed to people, we like them and they like us, right? So there's some research that when these professors planted people into a psychology lecture, none of the students remembered these people, but at the end of the semester, they liked this woman who showed up to the most lectures, 20% more than the woman that didn't show up to any. So it's completely mm. unconscious. We mm. like people we've been exposed to over time. But the implications of that is that when you first start connecting with people, mere exposure effect has not set in. So it's going to be awkward. <laughs> so you're going to feel weary. You're going to feel like I don't trust them. I don't feel comfortable with them, right? Like my issue in college going to a social club and feeling that way is I was like, okay, this isn't going to work out. I'm going to leave, right? Now that I've studied this, I realize that's not a sign it's not working out. That's a sign that it's part of the trajectory towards connection, right? It starts with this initial discomfort, a period of discomfort because mere exposure effect has not set in within the relationship. Mm. Mm. So that, that takes the, I think the theme almost even further, because what John and I will often talk a lot about various topics, how there seems to be this sweet spot, like you need to sort of sustain this struggle and you can find mm -hmm. this in performance literature. You can find it in motivation literature, right? All these different sorts of things. That's kind of what I hear you describing there. My question would be, and maybe there's no simple answer to this, like, how do you know when you've reached the sweet spot? Like, mm. oh, grit's cool, but sometimes you have to quit, right? Yeah. Like, oh, give people a chance, but sometimes you got to stop giving them a chance. Like, do you, do you have yeah. some how-tos or some markers or intuitive ways people might, you know, reflect on that sweet spot? Yeah, that's a great question. We were, we were talking about that in my class today, right? Because I said, you know, assume people like you because that's a self-fulfilling prophecy to make friends. But my yeah. students were like, well, uh, what's point does that become diminishing returns <laughs> and you have to move on right um and so you know i i don't actually know um one some things that i will share is that because we have this this cognitive bias in how we predict right our predictions when it comes to social interaction tend to be more negative than the truth we think people like us less yeah. than we do yeah. we think people see our vulnerability more negatively than it, they actually do right to not trust your predictions when deciding on that endpoint, but to trust more your experience after the interaction. After mm. the interaction, did you feel restored or did you feel drained, right? And if it's like, I, I say like the two month mark, I think mere exposure effect sets in by at least, you know, two months, it should start setting in. And if you mm. still feel after the interaction that, hey, I don't feel comfortable or I don't feel like I'm connecting with anyone, or I don't feel close to anyone, or I don't feel like these people are like my necessarily my people, then I give you full permission to end, to, to, to drop out. But I do also want to clarify, right? Because I talk about in the book that showing up for something repeated over time, so that a class rather than a lecture, right? Something repeated where you get that mere exposure effect. But I also talk about um, having to overcome something called covert avoidance. So covert avoidance is our tendency to show up physically, but check out mentally. So I'm at this hiking club, I'm at this rock climbing group, I'm at this knitting club, I'm at this book club, and I'm not talking to anyone. I'm on my phone. I'm talking to one person I know. I'm away in the corner. I'm watching the TV on the television. I'm not engaging with anyone, right? Oh, and I've been that dude. That yeah, resonates so hard. Yeah, me too. So I've been that dude. Yeah. yeah, so I'm coming to this social club and I'm like, why isn't anyone approaching me? Why isn't anyone welcoming me? Why is nobody saying hello? not holding myself accountable. Am I welcoming people? Am I initiating with people? Am I mm -hmm. saying hello? So I think sometimes it, we're still struggling at the two month mark because we're engaged in covert avoidance. So I also want to make sure you're, we're overcoming covert avoidance by engaging with people, showing interest in them. Hi, my name's Marissa. How have you liked this book club? Tell me more about your thoughts about this book. Like what other things do you like to read? Like we really have to put ourselves out there to find that connection. So you got this we like ecosystemic level, right? That could be impacting it. But you also have this me, like there's a locus of control. There's things that we can do. There's behaviors that we can execute to potentially create some of this change, right? Exactly. And it sounds like we should we should think about it and come at it from both lenses. We should. I think the, the lens of sy the systemic level is important because otherwise we think there's just something wrong with me, right? And, you know, 
when we, it's called like making these internal stable attributions, which is things are going wrong because there's something fundamentally wrong with me. Mm. That's related to being more lonely over time. So my hope is that when we recognize the systemic forces that are contributing to loneliness, we are able to not blame ourselves as much and to lean into the fact that, okay, we also have agency, even though it's hard, even though we have to really try, even though it's not going to happen organically, that there's also ways that we can engage, that we are, this isn't deterministic, right? We can be intentional about how we connect with people and be very successful at connecting with others. Mm. Fascinating connection there with what I think like cognitive behavioral theory would call thinking traps, right? And externalizing versus personalizing. I was just just doing some training on that this morning, actually. Really interesting overlaps. So interesting. Yeah. It's so John, cool to hear you all because you're like, well, it's connected to all these other psychology. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, really? Because yeah. all I talk about is friendship. So I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's a lot of fun for us. I mean, I, you know, I'm I was not kidding when I said probably four out of every five conversations we have bring up these themes and so yeah. hopefully it's enjoyable for the listeners to catch that as well but it's it's i mean it's a really profound um takeaway that i think now i'm just looking for it now it's almost confirmation bias right <laughs> but it but it's certainly every conversation seems to move us closer and closer like wow like unpleasantness really can create actually a lot of good if navigated you know thoughtfully so so let's dig a little deeper into these into this cultural shift um, you, you mentioned systemic change, but I, I, a point I took from your book was also that you, you think for us to value friendship more, we really do need some cultural changes, at least in, um, well, at least in the USA, which I take it is the primary, you know, nation you're speaking of in this book, but perhaps Western culture more broadly. I mean, I wouldn't want to generalize that too much because you see, in, and, and, and you, you would know about this, of course, being an expert on it, but for example, in, in certain Mediterranean countries, they I think they seem to value friendship a lot more than certainly in the UK and the US, at least in my anecdotal experience. Maybe I should mm-hmm. actually ask you about that before I go any further. What, what I'd, be is cur- the- I'd be curious to hear your comments on that, mm-hmm. how this varies in a cultural context, if at all. Yeah, I think it really does um, vary based on the cultural context. Like I talked to a woman that studied social connection in Nepal and she was like, well, people are around people all the time. Like if you talk about loneliness, it's not isolation. It's uh, Mm. feeling inauthentic around other people, right? Whereas I think in the US, we really struggle with actually being isolated from other people, right? And I think, you know, in different cultures, there's a lot more of a norm around um, being a good friend. Whereas I think sometimes in... In the U.S., it's like positive vibes only, good vibes only. Like if you're going through something, you're weighing me down and I and I have to drop you off, right? And, you know, I'm being a little bit facetious here. But, sure. I, but yeah, I think we, us in the U.S., I talk about like the difference between good company versus a good friend. Whereas to me, good company mm-hmm. is I enjoy your company and like you as a person, but that doesn't mean you're a good friend. A good friend mm-hmm. is a commitment to another person. It's an investment in them. It's a, I'm going to show up in your times of need. I'm going to, I'm going to celebrate you in your times of joy. I'm trying to make your life a little bit lighter. Right. So I think, you know, at least in the U S context, I think our definition of friendship (laughs) hinges a lot more on that good company than I think it should. I think in in a way that I think that really harms us. Whereas, and I, I'm not, a, you know, a cross-cultural researcher. So there's limitations in the degree to which I can say this country or or this country. Sure. Um, but I would say, you know, that I think other countries, their definition of friendship is more aligned with that good friend. This is a commitment and a responsibility to another person. Mm-hmm. That's where I thought you might go. So in our, I think, fourth, excuse me, fifth episode, John and I were chatting with um, Matt Lee, who at the time was at Harvard in the Human Flourishing Program. Now he's at Baylor and David Johnson of Department of Education of Oxford. And we asked David a pretty similar question. And he, he kind of like drew an X and Y axis for us and kind of said, you know, you can look at these different cultures and, and on the X axis, you're going to have happiness versus meaning. Mm-hmm. Right. And on the Y axis, you're going to have individualism versus communitarianism. And that's sort of what I hear in some of your answer. Right? Like there's going to be some cultural emphasis on sort of like, I don't need to feel pleasant all the time. I have obligations to the greater good or the greater mm-hmm. whole. And that probably includes friendships, community, different platonic relationships. Right. I, I would I would guess anyway. Right. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I guess one thing to point out is that the 
the cultures you have in mind are those in which individualism is really celebrated because you point that exactly. out with the rise of individualism and the you talk about the Protestant work ethic mm-hmm. and so on. Um, those are within the scope of your claims here. Yep. And you also point out that, I mean, I'll, I'll quote you here, despite connection being a fundamental value of our species, it's not a fundamental value of Western society. Yep. So it is Western society, might it, but of course there would be variation. You know, variation, yeah. for example, perhaps through some of the countries I've mentioned, Mediterranean cultures. I mean, I don't have data to hand on this. It's just mm-hmm. an anecdotal observation. That I, the first thing I notice whenever I arriving in Greece or Spain or Italy is the val- relationships are valued so much more than work. And I, mm. I, I notice the inverse in the UK and the USA that work is valued so much more than relationships. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when it, when it comes to the history and the social forces, I've turned to historians to kind of try to understand what happened. And what I found through like Stephanie Kuhn's work, she's a historian who studied kind of marriage throughout history and that, you know, um, in the 1700s and before people got married for resources, you know, it, it made sense. It increased my, rep- elevated my reputation to get married to you. It's not about love. And at that time, friendships were a lot more romantic because, you know, going into the 1800s, the assumption was you can only connect deeply with people that share your gender. So you're going to, you know, people did things at that time, like write their name, carve their name into the tree in in hearts or go on each other's honeymoon or cuddle in bed with each other and, um, and write love letters to their friends. Like Frederick Douglass says, his friends are what shook his decision to leave the plantation more than anything else. Yeah. And what changed was, um, you know, before 1867, it was taboo to have sex with someone of the same sex. But sexual orientation, as we know it, did not exist until Richard von Kraft Ebbing and Sigmund Freud, they they kind of helped to develop the, the idea of sexual orientation that we have now, which they kind of argued that if you have sex with someone of the same sex, it reflects this entire disordered identity, right? It's, it's not just bad to have sex with someone of the same sex, it's bad to do anything that conveys this identity, right? And so now there are all these behaviors that were normal in friendship, like, you know, even you, you'll see males football teams at the time, they're all cuddling in each other's arms, right? So now all these behaviors like that physical intimacy, like that deep expressions of affection, all of a sudden people were like, oh, this could indicate that I have this stigmatized sexual orientation. So now I can't engage in all of these behaviors that promote intimacy and friendship because I have this fear that it could mark me as the sexual orientation that is seen as as a, a stigmatized, right? And so in the, the research term for it, and I don't think this is in the psychology world, but it's, it's homo hysteria, which is men's mm-hmm. fear of being perceived as gay. And we find that men that, for example, are more homophobic also disclose less intimately in their friendships with other men. So- sure. I think homo hysteria, because we, you know, we see from the data that men are half as likely to access support within their friendships in a given week, half as likely to express affection with their friends, wow. right? Wow. It's pretty yeah. bad. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. also more likely to have no friends than women are. And so, um, you know, I think what's at play is this, this homo hysteria, this feeling of stuckness that some men have between, I want intimacy and connection, but if I try to do this, then... Am I going to come off? Am, are people going to stigmatize me? Are people going to stigmatize my sexual orientation or my sense of my masculinity? That sounds like what you described earlier as rejection sensitivity. Is, is okay. H- how do you deal with the rejection sen- sensitivity? Like, are there ways you can train against it? I guess would be yeah. the phrasing. So, um, one approach that I'm trying with my students is like Rick Hansen. He's a psychologist. Yeah. Yeah. You know him. He's yeah, I've yeah, read podcast? a couple of his, but I would love to have Rick on and his son, for that matter. They oh, have totally. a wonderful podcast as well. I love but their I've read podcast. A, I, yeah, I've read a couple of Rick's books, and they're they're fantastic. Yeah, I, yeah. So you you might know about his heal model, which he's yep. yeah. He has this whole framework for like taking in the good, and that we need to savor positive experiences so that our brain automatically savors them, like it does for negative experiences. And it's a practice of when you have a positive experience focusing on it, pausing until it stirs an emotion inside of you, which he says releases norepinephrine and dopamine and those, you know, those promote um, changes, neuroplasticity, changes in your brain so that you begin to, you know, more and more your brain automatically acknowledges the positive, right? And so I like to co-op his model because I think it's really helpful for um, socializing, right? Like 
finding experiences of social safety with other people and taking them in and receiving them and focusing on them until it stirs joy in you, until it stirs feelings of safety and security in you um, to help you be, because rejection sensitivity, it's not just like, it's like you tend to see rejection when it's not there. And when it happens, you take it a lot more negatively, (laughs) right? Um, So I think acknowledging the social safety, it gives you more resources to handle those experiences of rejection. And it maybe make, I imagine his research, not that I've seen been applied specifically to social interaction, that it could also make people less likely to sign, always filter for the negative in interactions. Yeah. Hey, great. But, Thank you. Right. I, I, we, I should get back to the cultural changes that we want to that we want to see before we before we lose sight of that question. So you, you argue we need a cultural change, and perhaps through this we can also get some more of your practical takeaways out of this. One of them yeah. is clearly that we need to stop prioritizing romantic relationships so much about friendships. Yep. And you speak a lot about contemporary attitudes towards friendships and how those are kind of not only that, well, yeah, and and how those are damaging to forming friendships. So about excessive boundary setting or what it really means to set a boundary and those could prevent close friendships from forming. So yeah. could you please elaborate on what kind of cultural change you think is needed in order for platonic friendship, platonic relationships to be valued like you argue we should value them? Yeah, I would love to see, you know, this makes me sound radical, but if you look into history, it's not that radical. <laughs> um, I would just love to see policies, for example, that could formally recognize friends. I'd love to see if we could give health insurance to someone of our choice rather than it having to be a spouse or Mm -hmm. there's a formal ceremony for recognizing a domestic partnership amongst friends rather than, you know, a marriage. Um, You know, I think there's just a lot of ways that encoded Mm -hmm. in our laws, like who can visit you at the uh, the hospitals, like you have to be a family member or a spouse that we, our policies, like if, if you didn't know nothing about our society and you read our policies, you would see that this, you would assume that this society doesn't value friendship as highly as these other forms of social connection. Um, I would also love to see us, we should have a class on socio-emotional learning for kids that are very young. (laughs) Like, I just feel like this would pay dividends throughout their entire life. It would probably help our economy. It would help with mental health issues. It would help with physical health issues, right? Like, this should be a mandatory part of our curriculum. Um, at a very young age that kids are, this is formalized within our schools, that kids are learning how to better connect with each other. And I know some people are doing that, you know, I consult for some groups that do that, but it's not, um, it's not widely available. I mean, I see it with my students. I'm like, wow, they're really learning a lot. They're really making some changes right before my eyes. The other thing is that I think we need boundaries around technology. I think Mm. social media can be used for connection. But most of the time it is not because it is not designed in ways to be used for connection. It's designed to keep us scrolling. When we know that scrolling, it it has negative effects on our mental health. It makes us feel more lonely and disconnected, right? Um, There's this theory called displacement theory. And the idea is that when we use technology to displace in-person interactions, we're more lonely. When we're scrolling on our TikTok every day and we're not actually making any friends, you know, we're more lonely. But when we use social technology to facilitate in-person interaction, we're less lonely than people that aren't on technology, right? So those people that slide into the Instagram DMs and be like, oh, it's great to see your story. How have you been? I'd love to hang out, right? They're actually less lonely than the people that aren't on social media. So it's it's the duality of social media is a tool and we can use it to disconnect or connect. But also just like we talked about the systemic issues, the ways that it is, are, is designed are not for connection because that's taking you off the app, right? If you're connecting in person, that means you're not spending time scrolling. Mm-hmm. Um, so I also wish that there could be some some boundaries around um, technology use. Like I even saw with my students, I made them hang out without their phones and they were like, there's an awkward silence. (laughs) And usually I would take out my phone, but then I actually came up with something to say. And like the conversation got deeper and I was amazed. And I was like, yeah, you would be surprised by when you don't use your phone as a crutch, the conversation is actually a lot more rich. Wow. Covert avoidance, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. um, right. Well, we really want to take things directly into the connection with flourishing now. Before we do that, though, what I what I would actually would love to ask you is um, just if there's a kind of a simple question that someone could ask themselves to assess whether they've got a really strong platonic relationship in their life. So one of the questions I like from positive psychology is: Is there someone in your life you can call any time of day or night to talk to? 
Yeah. I mean, conceivably about anything and they'll pick up the phone. They won't hang up on you. Be like, what the hell are you calling me? They'll be like, oh yeah, sure. Go on. What's yeah. up? What's up, man? Um, I take that to be a really good measure because you immediately think of the people that you could conceivably do that with. And, and it's, you know, it's just your closest bonds, right? True. So do you, do you have a particular question or small set of questions that someone could ask themselves to assess uh, this is a good measure of, of strong platonic relationships in their life? Yeah, my question is, and this is really this, I think the strongest level of platonic relationships is like outside of your spouse, do you have someone to confide in? Because Mm -hmm. um, there is a study, this is related to flourishing, 106 factors that influence our depressive symptoms. The number one preventer was having someone to confide in. Mm. Wow. Okay, that's That's that tend and befriend stress response, it seems to me, that you often hear about, right? Like we are biologically wired to respond to adversity often by reaching out to get or give support. Exactly. Exactly. Unless we've... um, unless we've experienced a lot of punishing when we've tried to do that, avoidant, we attach people. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's yeah. where we're going to go next. Cause so John's question leads yeah. us to like, what's a flourishing relationship look like? And so, okay, if I can confide in somebody, right. Mm-hmm. Fine. And is that moderated by again, attachment style, gender, age, like what's, you know, I, obviously we can't pin you in a quarter and say, just tell everybody, regardless of context and age and whatever, like how you do this, but what are some of, are there types, are there categories? Does it break down by style? Could you differentiate a little bit? Yeah, I think there could be a cross-cultural piece to this, right? Because I think different cultures respond differently to things like vulnerability. Um, so it's hard for me to say there's, yes. there's a universal around that. Um, I, but I do feel like, like, I, I I feel like before I wrote platonic, I was, I kind of like essentialized gender more like, oh, like maybe women need more vulnerability in their relationships with men. But I don't think that's true. I think men need just as much vulnerability. I think they're just in a state of deprivation with getting it. Like really, I think we all need, I mean, American context, that is like yeah, this, sure. this deep vulnerability. And we know from the research that concealing your emotions is related to distress and suicidality and you're less likely to make friends and people like you less. And it, it, I mean, you have more health problems in the next year. Like oh, it's just really in the U S context, I'll say so toxic for us to never be vulnerable with anyone. Like it's really, really just decimates us like physically, mentally and our relationships. So that's one that I think is really important to be able to access like just people you could be vulnerable with like people you could say what's really going on with and and that that is really mutual um and i think you know another characteristic kind of related to that for flourishing friendships is i think um we john you kind of alluded to this before like this hyper boundary setting culture that we have that also happens to occur alongside this kind of martyr culture that particularly women tend to have, where it feels like you have to give and give and give and always be generous and almost like you're a mother to everybody in your life, right? And I think what flourishing relationships have is they have something called mutuality, which is not, I'm going to self-sacrifice endlessly for you, not you're going to self-sacrifice endlessly for me. It's we're both considering both of us and trying to figure out something that works for the both of us. So in the moments when your needs are more urgent, we're going to prioritize you. In the moments when I'm low and I really need help, I'm going to prioritize me in this relationship, right? And, you know, just an example of this, right? If my friend is calling me, I talk about this in platonic, they call me at 10 p.m. to talk about the last episode of Love is Blind, I might be like, I'm tired. I can't talk about this right now. Likely, I wouldn't say that because I'm always down to talk about love is blind. <laughs> but um, if they t- call us at 10 o'clock and they say, you know, my kid's been harming themselves and I just found out about this and I'm really scared, like that's not a time to set your boundaries, right? You, like boundaries are something to protect the relationship with someone else. So it's like right now I need to pull away and have some space for myself because that's going to allow me to continue to be in relationship with you. And we know this from a theory called equilibrium theory that finds that when we spend time alone, we have a natu- natural desire for relationships. When we spend time in relationships, we come to have a natural desire for our alone time and our autonomy, right? So autonomy is relationship promoting because when we take our autonomy, then we have more energy to then invest in our relationships, right? So mutuality really acknowledges that. Like 
you take your time, you take your space, because that's part of you showing up in the best way in this relationship, right? And both of us are invested in fulfilling both of our needs. Okay, so we have four we have four conditions. Do you want to go? Sorry. Well, I'm just like, it always comes in. It's one of my favorite quotes. I spent 12 years at, at a Jewish day school in Los Angeles. And there was something I pulled out of there. Um, I can't remember ex- the exact source of the ethics of the fathers. But if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? And mm. this idea of equilibrium comes up time and time again as well, right? Not over-indexing on one particular area, but thinking about that yin and yang, if you will, right? And sort of that synergy between what seem like different ends of a, a you know, some a polar opposites in some cases, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, I love it. I love the all, yin and all yang. I, all I was, yeah, thank you very much for that. All I was going to do is just sum up, it sounds like there's four conditions, if you like, to a flourishing or thriving friendship here, mutuality, vulnerability, authenticity, and confidentiality, but not strictly speaking, not really that, in the sense which you can confide in someone, trust yep. them. Yep, things, right? trust, yeah, definitely. I like those. Thank you for identifying them. <laughs> <laughs> we can maybe form, your form next an chapter, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I can't see an acronym we can form out of those, CMVA. Mm. I well, I have, um, I do have one acronym I use when I speak on connection and belonging. Oh, great. And it's more so for, for friendship throughout the lifespan. And it's the idea model, which is you need to initiate, disclose, expose. So repeated interactions with someone and affirm. Love it. Awesome. Love yeah. it. So one other uh, question concerning the relationship between platonic like relationships and friendships, Marissa, would be clear in your book, it seems that well, you, you make a very strong argument that cultivating good platonic relationships has an impact on various areas of human well-being. Mm-hmm. Would you like to elaborate on that a little, little further? Absolutely. It's necessary for mental health, necessary for physical health, necessary for sleep. When we're lonely, we engage in micro wakes, which means like we're like basically scanning for threats. So we have these like micro wakes. Um, obviously necessary for our relationships, but not just our platonic relationships, also our romantic ones. Like our romantic relationships are healthier when we have friends. When we get into conflict with a spouse, it disrupts our stress hormone regulation. It disrupts our release of of cortisol, right? But not if you have quality connection outside of that marriage or when one person gets a friend, not only are they less depressed, their spouse is less depressed too. So it's necessary. It's a necessary kind of alley-oop or assist to all the other in our relationships in our lives too. Love it. Pathway. Love the cool. alley oop metaphor there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So, all right. So let's we'll wrap with kind of our signature question, um, super creatively titled "The Flourishing Question." I'd like to pull back to idea for a second. You just remind me what the E was again, or is? Expose. Expose. Okay. Mm-hmm. So initiate, disclose, expose, affirm. Right. Mm-hmm. Our flourishing question is like if. It's a the tough one, but if you could boil it down to our listeners, like what's the one thing that they might do? Can I tease it a little bit and like actually say what might be the one thing they could do for each element of idea that would mm. maybe move a friendship forward, right? How might they initiate? How might they disclose in an effective way, right, et cetera? Yeah. So you initiate by saying, Hey, it's been so great to talk to you. I'd love to further connect. If you're open to it, could we exchange contact information, right? Um, You disclose by next time you're hanging out with someone, sharing something that you're actually struggling with. Mm. You expose by committing to some sort of social interaction that's repeated over time and or turning your existing friendships into something repeated. Like let's do a monthly dinner together, for example. You affirm by looking for something to love in everyone that you meet and freely expressing to people just what it is that you like about them. Perfect. Boom. Awesome. Love that. Concise, effective to the point. That's awesome. Thank you, Marissa. Yes. Uh, my yeah. pleasure. Yeah. This this was this was really, really great. The book is fantastic. You're fantastic. I learned a ton. Um, really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for taking the time. Yay. Where can people get in touch or find your work? Yeah. So on my Instagram at Dr. Marissa G. Franco, that's D-R-M-A-R-I-S-A-G-F-R-A-N-C-O. I share fresh research-based tips when it comes to connection. And on my website, drmarissagfranco.com, you can access that quiz that tells you your strengths and weaknesses as a friend. 
You can reach out for speaking engagements on how to make friends or how to find belonging at work. Or you can buy my New York Times bestselling book, Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week. Take care. Huge thanks to all of you for listening to today's show. If you like what you heard, please share it with friends, family, colleagues, and be sure to leave us a five-star review. Uh, You can also find us on all social media platforms. Uh, We've got our own YouTube channel, and you can check out our website at flourishfmpodcast.com. We'd also love to hear from you. There's a survey in the show notes you can complete where you can complete any suggestions on guests you'd like to hear us interview or particular topics or themes you'd like to hear us talk about. We'd love to hear your feedback on that. So your feedback would be greatly appreciated if you could fill out that form. Until next time, thank you very much for joining us today. And keep putting in the work.